Adam, what can death teach us about life? Huh. Well, I think the first thing I would say is that actually death is not separate from life. You know, it's it's one very significant milestone in a con continuity that has no no end. So I think that's that's pretty valuable. But actually, as we approach death, it often helps us to reflect very deeply on our life. And as we reflect on death at any age, it often brings life into focus. You know, so I think it, um, it's a very valuable tool to help us live our lives more fully, more meaningfully, with more purpose, you know. And I think if, if we didn't have to die, we might live our lives much more superficially, <laughs> you know. So it adds a weight, you know, and um, something very precious. I think death is an extraordinary gift to us. You've had your own experiences with this very personally. Mm. Can you tell me who is Hayden Robarts? Yeah. Hayden is one of our four children. Um, Karen and I had four children, all born and raised in China. Um, Hayden was number three in that, in that grouping, and he was 19 when he passed away. Um, he was 19 when he was diagnosed with brain cancer. Um, he had a four centimeter diameter tumor on the midbrain. And uh, so as we did everything we could, you know, he had the best medical care we could find. And he did chemotherapy and then radiation. And then after that, he did a, a clinical trial in New York. Um, but in the end, the cancer was very aggressive and it wasn't able to be cured. Uh, according to the science that we have now. So Hayden passed away after nine and a half months of this grueling journey through cancer. Uh, and he died one month before his 20th birthday. So he was 19. Yeah. Can you tell me how that journey went, those nine months? Yeah. You know, I describe that journey as a mountain climb. And... You know, when asked about mountain climbing, it's hard work, it's grueling, times scary, you know, when you hit deep, you know, crevices or cliff edges. Um, there were plenty of those in our journey with Hayden. Um, so it was, it was tense, you know, and there were many times on that journey where we thought Hayden wouldn't make it through a particular weekend or, you know, a particular treatment. Um, so... But there were times when there was great joy, like we would, something would happen that would just give us hope, you know, or that Hayden would say things or realize things, or that we as a family would realize how close we had become. And we would feel incredible waves of gratitude, you know, a real sense that we were climbing a steep slope together and a sense that there were, there were victories, there were achievements, there were incredible joys in that journey. But it was also a journey of extraordinary hardship and difficulty and emotional exhaustion. Yeah, so I think mountain climbing for me became the, the kind of perfect metaphor for what we were doing. Um, and uh, I think also to describe those nine and a half months, I mean, there's the whole medical side to it. I mean, we were complete newbies. We didn't know what we were going into. Um, and remember that the second half of that journey during the early months of 2020 were during COVID, right? So we were in New York when COVID hit. Um, Hayden was almost one of the first patients into uh, the hospital that, you know, had triage and had to deal with dealing with triage for for COVID, you know, um, it was it was a very tense time. And when we got to Canada for the palliative stage of his journey, there were times, most of the time, when we couldn't have anybody come and visit us, you know, because COVID was raging mm. and everyone was keeping separate, you know, separate spaces in their own homes. And so actually doctors and nurses couldn't just come in. So we were actually becoming COVID 
nurses, you know, in our own home with our own son as the patient, you know, and giving, you know, uh, subcutaneous injections, you know, with heavy duty drugs. That's pretty scary stuff, you know, for somebody who's not trained as a nurse, but dealing with it and doing my best, but on Zoom, you know, with the real doctors and nurses who couldn't actually be with us. Um, so we really accompanied him right to the very, to his last breath. And then actually even after he passed away, the coffin was brought to our home and left at the doorstep by the funeral home. And we brought that into the house and we prepared Hayden's body and actually had to place him in his own coffin as a family because there was nobody else. So, I mean, extraordinary, I mean, really surreal. Um, but at the same time, sacred, you know, and opportunities for that sacredness to be very, very present that may not have been there under normal circumstances, you know? So, yeah, I, I describe it. It really is surreal. It's almost just talking about it now, four years later, just thinking, how did we experience that? How did we end up in that place at that time to experience what would not normally be possible you know it was um a real a gift to us as a family can you describe some of those moments of joy yeah i think most of those moments of joy relate to seeing hayden's ability to deal with distress to deal with suffering you know here he was he was 19 years old he didn't want to die right he didn't want to be doing this whole cancer journey it was absolutely unexpected it was a tragedy beyond what we could have ever imagined he wanted to live um, but faced with his demise faced with a doctor saying there is no cure and really you should now maybe prepare for the palliative stage of your journey to see Hayden literally accept and not only accept, but to do so with grace and a sense of faith, a sense that it was okay. You know, I just felt those were, I mean, Karen often describes Hayden's reaction to the doctors when they told him about you know, the verdict, um, the proudest moment of her life, you know, as a parent. Because, you know, often parents want their children to go to Harvard or get into the football team or buy their first house or whatever, you know, these things that we think of as success. But when your child is told, you know, really sorry, there's, we've come to the end of the curative path and now you should prepare for palliation and maybe just a few weeks or maybe a couple of months. And, you know, yes, there were a few tears. And then he thanked the doctors for doing everything that they could have done, you know, and he acknowledged that. And then he put his hand on his mum's shoulder to comfort her, you know, and for me too, you know, in that little tiny room in Princess Margaret Hospital. And, you know, there is a moment where I just thought, although I was in absolute agony, you know, at this, at this terrible news, I saw my son rise to the occasion. I saw him demonstrate a depth of character that I think is really our purpose as parents, is to raise children who can have strong characters to deal with whatever comes their way. Um, and I think Karen describing it as her proudest moment is a real sign of where she puts her priorities, you know, on on the character of the child. Um, but there were many moments in Hayden's journey where, you know, the lady from the local pizza shop would deliver a pizza to him, you know, in his last weeks of life. Um, and, of course, she couldn't bring it into the house because of COVID, but she would deliver it to the door and then come to the window, and he would just graciously acknowledge her and you know, make her feel like she was a queen, you know, and that gratitude for the tiniest things, you know, even 
a glass of water, you know, having his foot massaged, you know. I would look at him and it just made me feel proud. Made me feel made me feel a deep sense of joy and respect, you know, that here was somebody who was ready to graduate. You know, he was ready to graduate from this world. Um, and there were moments that I describe in the book, you know, that, that I wrote about this journey, where <laughs> one night, you know, 3.30 in the morning, Hayden would often get up in the night, you know, he needed to go to the toilet, you know, or he would sometimes get hungry, actually, in the middle of the night. And he would sometimes ask for a waffle or you know something so I'd go to the kitchen and make his waffle you know and put put some berries on the top of it and sit beside him in the dead of night because I was actually sleeping beside him just there was always had to be someone close to him um in those last weeks and I sat next to him and it was 3 30 in the morning the house was dead quiet and I said something that I can't imagine where it came from but my love for him was so great and I said Hayden I wish I could come with you what a terrible thing to say to a 19 year old as if he didn't have enough pressure on him enough burden on his shoulders mm. you know and he looked at me and he said dad would you like to finish my waffle <laughs> <laughs> it's like what a sweet way to connect to his dad who was just in pain you know those moments where I just could see his joy his spirit you know I could go on and on but this, those are a few that come to mind yeah can you describe uh, how this process of preparing his body made you feel yeah You know, I think the body in the Baha'i faith is the temple of the soul, right? So we don't see it as, you know, just flesh, right? So we honor it. We honor it during life. We take care of it. Um, and we honor it, of course, in death, you know? So there is in the Baha'i faith guidance on how to uh, to deal with the body that has died. Um, and we prepare it, we wash it, we wrap it in silk, if possible. Um, and it's buried in a, in a good quality coffin, you know, of hardwood. Uh, so that process of honoring the body, of preparing the body, um, is much more poignant when that body is your son, right? Um, there was such mixed emotion on the one hand of this sort of sacred responsibility of concluding the journey of that temple of Hayden's soul that has now been released to its onward journey. Um, but on the other hand, relief, because that body had been pummeled, had been absolutely stricken with a very severe disease. And finally, Hayden was free of it, you know. So it was a very mixed, very strange, but somehow Karen made it beautiful. You know, we had sponges that were beautiful, natural sponges. She had found, I can't remember where they were from, the Dead Sea or somewhere interesting, you know, and she had a tar of rose to anoint his body as well and some rose petals that we sprinkled uh, over his shrouded body. Um, and then we closed the lid of the coffin and we sang or we chanted, you know, a Baha'i prayer together and then took the, took the coffin out to the hearse that was waiting um, and then, then took it for its interment, you know, at the cemetery. Um, so very sacred, very, very sacred. Um, and we all participated as a family, you know, one of us washing his feet, the other one his chest or his face, his arms. Um, but it was done in a spirit 
not of washing a body, but of honoring a temple for the soul, you know, of saying our final goodbyes, you know, and actually even something as sad as that final farewell can be beautiful, can be honorable and noble, dignified and infused with the spirit. Mm. So I don't think there's anything ever to be afraid of. You know, I think this is one of my biggest lessons about Hayden's journey is that so many of us are afraid of death. Um, and I think that doesn't, that is not necessary. We might be afraid of how we die. You know, nobody wants to die in a very violent way, you know. But to actually be afraid of dying would be like an embryo being afraid of being born. You know, it's like, actually, it's very important that we are born. Otherwise, the whole purpose of that nine months in the womb would be useless, right? So in this world, if we're afraid of death, we're actually limiting a natural journey that must happen. Um, so Hayden taught me not to be afraid of death. There's two quotes I wanted to get your thoughts on, and this is something that the Baha'i writings remind us about. Mm -hmm. These are from Baha'u'llah. His first one to, in his tablet to Napoleon III. He says, he says, Rejoicest thou in that thou rulest a span of earth, when the whole world, in the estimation of the people of Baha, is worth as much as the black in the eye of a dead ant. <laughs> And then in another prayer, he says, I beseech thee to raise this servant up to such heights that he will regard the world even as a shadow that vanisheth swifter than the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. Well, listening to those two quotes is really a reminder that we've kind of got it wrong in our educational system and in the cultures we have, especially in the sort of industrialized, liberalized, advanced world. You know, I think maybe some of the indigenous societies of the world still kind of understand those things. Um, but with all of our advancement, with all of our civilization and progress, we have completely put the priorities maybe on the wrong things, right? You know, so that quote by, by Baha'u'llah that this material world, you know, is worth you know, it equates to the the eye of a, the black of the eye of a dead ant. <laughs> you know, it's like okay. So, what is valuable? What is valuable? What is what is worth building? And the Baha'i teachings describe the virtues as being worth building. You know, worth developing. That's what we take with us. The rest we leave behind, right? So. Those qualities of kindness, of love, compassion, gentleness, humility, those are worth gold. You know, this stuff, it's the eye of the dead ant, right? So are we educated to go for gold? Or are we educated to, to waste our time, you know, pursuing the vanities of this earth. Unfortunately, sometimes we are educated in the material priorities. And that's a terrible distraction, really a terrible distraction, and not a source of happiness. You know, the more we have in terms of materials doesn't make us happier, right? So we need to find or rebalance uh, the system. So, yeah, I think that's. Uh, the first part of the quote by, by, by Baha'u'llah to Napoleon. The second quote that you read, John, can you just read it again for us? I beseech thee to raise this servant up to such heights that he will regard the world even as a shadow that vanisheth swifter than the twinkling of an eye. Hmm. So isn't that beautiful? The idea that this world is a shadow. So what is it a shadow of? You know, that's when having gone through this extraordinary journey of accompanying my son to the veil through which he then goes into whatever lies beyond, whatever that next world, that afterlife, that heaven is. Which is real? Is it that this is real and that's the kind of shadow that we don't really understand? You know, a little bit ephemeral, mysterious. 
Or actually, is that the reality? And this is the shadow. You know, that's what Baha'u'llah is saying. You know, that we will regard this world as the shadow. Um, so, yeah, I've come to believe from my journey with Hayden more and more that we are in danger if we put our priorities entirely on the material realm. We are material, but, you know, in the words of Teilhard de Chardin, we are spiritual beings having a material uh, existence. We're not material beings, you know, aspiring for some spiritual existence. You know, fundamentally we're spiritual. Fundamentally we belong to that real world. But here we are passing through like a shadow, you know, this material reality. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those quotes. Uh, you know, they're great. You're welcome. How do you think we can remember that, that we are spiritual beings, mm. that this world is, in the estimation of God is as dust, that we have rent to pay, groceries to buy, yeah. it's like the day to day. How do we remember this? Yeah. Constantly. Constantly. In our conversations, in the way we raise our children, in our school systems, in our companies, with every breath we take. You know, this is not something for Sunday morning. You know, this is part of who we are. We should talk about it all the time. You know, if that's what's important to us. And not only talk about it, we should do it. We should live as if that's what we were. You know, if we are spiritual beings, that's not something to go on the shelf. That's something that has to go through every breath, every step we take. You know, when you look into someone's eyes, you know, am I thinking, okay, this is Bashir, you know, and he's this tall and he's wearing a blue shirt and I just see the material reality? Or do I look into your eyes and I think, I have the privilege of speaking with a spiritual being. What an honor. What did I do to deserve that? You know, and to connect with a sense of awe and mystery and beauty and wonder um, and love. You know, that that's a game changer. That is a game changer. Yeah. So, after this journey, you wrote this book, 19, 19 Lessons, Insights from a uh, 19-year-old with cancer. What uh, lesson do you think that right now the world needs to hear most? <laughs> Gosh, that's so difficult. It's like saying, which is your favorite child? It's like, oh dear, don't go there. Because they're all connected, you know. Um, or which is your favorite planet? You know, one planet without the others. It's not a solar system. Um, so I think all the lessons we learn, all of the virtues, these spiritual qualities that we talk about as our, our reality, um, they all belong together, you know, they're one system, you know. So taking a priority one is really dangerous territory. But let me um let me take a risk. Okay, so I'd say for for young people today, especially young people today, probably the most important step to take right now is the one I put as chapter one, which is acceptance. You know, if we're climbing a steep mountain before you can climb that mountain, you've got to accept the mountain. <laughs> and not only accept that mountain, but accept that this is you on the mountain. So accepting yourself. And that means that there is no room to be angry with the mountain or frustrated with the mountain or what the heck am I doing on this mountain? Or that mountain looks way too steep, you know, Nothing you can do about any of those things. So first step, accept. There it is. That's the mountain. And that's you on the mountain. So accepting the mountain, accepting oneself. Then you can begin to climb. But if you're fighting it, you're on your way down. 
So I think accepting is a really critical first step. And it's an easy first step, you know, but it means we have to put away blame, anger, frustration, guilt, you know, all of these things that hamper us from actually taking those steps to climb the mountain. And those just become baggage. So let's get rid of that. And then we've got a chance. So I think acceptance is very important, especially for people who have been through COVID and young people whose lives have been so disrupted. Um, that's your mountain. And that's you on the mountain. And it's perfect. As it is. Okay, now let's begin the journey. Right? So I would say there. Um, and you know, by the way, Hayden exemplified that in his journey. When he was told he had an incurable cancer, he never at one point in his whole journey of nine and a half months said, why me? Never. If anything, he might have said, why not me? That gave him incredible strength. If I can be bold and take another lesson out of the 19, <laughs> I'd probably take faith. You know, faith was the hardest one for me to write about because I think we have terribly misunderstood faith, you know, um, often associating it with things that are unscientific, things that are actually more to do with superstition, you know, things that are irrational. Um, but faith, if we redefine it the way Abdul Baha defines faith, first he says faith is conscious knowledge. And secondly, the practice of good deeds, right? So faith is something that scientists need when they go into a lab to do their, to do their science. You know, you've got to believe in that journey, you know, and got to have a scientific approach to the investigation of truth. That's a journey of faith. Um, it's conscious, it's based on knowledge, um, it's a search for truth. Um, and it exists amongst scientists as well as amongst religionists. And it's very, very important if we're going to climb steep mountains. So, you know, Hayden's faith was for me remarkable. It was his superpower, you know. And it wasn't that he had some blind faith. You know, he was a scientist. He loved science, you know. Um, he had a book by Elon Musk, you know, beside his bed. And, and he also had... Baha'i scriptures beside his bed, you know. So that was Hayden. And from childhood he had this remarkable faith. Um, and that faith remarkably <laughs> just got stronger. And in chapter 5 on faith, I share a letter that Hayden wrote to his younger brother just before he passed away. None of us knew about this letter it was something that Hayden wrote. I think he must have felt that things might were going to be difficult after Hayden passed. If he was going to die, he wanted to leave something that might be helpful, especially to his younger brother. So he wrote a letter and gave it to his mum. And Karen held this letter, and when Hayden passed away, she gave it to Keon. And with Keon's permission, I published it in that chapter on faith. And actually, to me, that cha that that letter from Hayden to Keon is kind of the soul of this book. With your permission, I could read a bit of it if you want to do that. Yeah? Let's, um, let's see if we can find this here. So this is the chapter on faith. And here's the letter that Hayden read, Hayden wrote to Keon. If you're reading this, it means I've probably passed away, despite everyone's best efforts to keep me in good health. I want you to know that that's okay. We all gave it our best shot, and ultimately whatever happens is as God wills it. Please don't feel sad on my behalf, for I am in a better place, a place where evil doesn't exist a place of pure love and joy. Of this I am certain. Picture a beautiful garden with life flourishing everywhere, 
with streaming water and radiant light, the sound of laughter in the air, the smell of fresh flowers. This is an image I've been using to keep me happy in the last few days. Whenever you feel sad or depressed or confused, close your eyes, take a deep breath, hear the water, and imagine us in that setting, in a world where there are no troubles. Alternatively, if you're ever feeling down or sad because of my passing, turn to God, say some prayers. Remember, I will always be around you, watching over you, and so is God. It may not make sense why there is suffering in the world and why things like this happen. I often wondered the same thing and never quite understood it until these past few weeks. Suffering brings us closer to God and can make us realize things that we had never understood before. I truly don't think I've ever felt as much deep joy and happiness as I have over the past few weeks. Sorry, I'm going to read that sentence again, because every time I read it, it blows my mind that here is somebody going through hell, you know, in great pain, suffering, and says, I don't think I've ever felt as much deep joy and happiness as I have over the past few weeks. I've felt closer to God, closer to our family, and I've had hope for a better world, one that is united, joyous, beautiful, and flourishing. I may never have felt this if not for my cancer and coming so close to death. So even though it may seem like a terrible thing from the outside, it has also brought about many positives. He continues, and then he finishes, I love you so much. Hayden. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, how does one have that kind of faith when you're going through hell? Yeah, I find it remarkable. Why do you think he had this capacity to yeah. just step up? Yeah. You know, I think when we die, these things become clear to us, and that's one of my questions. You know, but I can have some guesses. I think partially because of his mum. I mean, Karen is a remarkable woman, you know, and I think played an extraordinary part in educating and raising our children. Um, and especially Hayden. She was very close to him. And he has qualities that are otherworldly. You know, we all do potentially, right? But I think he was, those were nurtured by Karen, lovingly, patiently nurtured. Year by year, day by day. Um, I think partially because he was raised in China. I think that was a very healthy environment to raise children. You know, Chinese wisdom, Chinese depth of culture was good for him. You know, he got it. He absorbed it. Um, all the children did, you know, but Hayden really had a love for China. Um, and of course, his faith, you know, he was a Baha'i, he went to a Christian school, he had friends who were Buddhists, who were atheists. He was open and welcoming to all. Um, I think his, his love of God gave him an extraordinary strength. You know, and if you really have that love of God, then dying in this world doesn't end it. In fact, it might even make that love closer. We don't know. Yeah. And he supported Arsenal. <laughs> that gave him great strength. <laughs> I want to ask you about acceptance and it feels that you radiate this virtue. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how that came to be. Yeah. yeah. You know, I watched something very special, very sacred. You know, a 19 year old approaching his end of life, you know, with a strength that gave me extraordinary strength. You know, we describe this as a mountain climb. And often, and my picture was that this was Hayden's mountain. He was climbing it. I was his climbing companion. Much later, 
I came to realize that actually I climbed that mountain and I came back to tell the story and that's the book 19 and well in that case he was my climbing companion and he helped me he helped me to climb a mountain that I was not ready for but which we climbed and I came out stronger as a result more able to to accept you know Hayden said you know when Hayden was 12 years old he was in the back of the car with his siblings and uh, Karen was driving I wasn't there but the story that I heard from Karen and the children was that one of the children Cyan said to her brothers so how would you like to die right and they each went around and they said how they would like to die uh, they're kids right at that stage you know like 15 14 12 you know and so and it came to Hayden's turn he was last he said I would like to die saving somebody's life I think Karen was very touched and moved by that and I've often reflected on that and I think he did he saved my life for a start you know I was very comfortable I was in a rut enjoying my work enjoying my my rut you know uh doing the things i did and i don't think i was necessarily growing very much you know i was comfortable doing what i was doing because i thought i was doing it reasonably well comfort is not a great condition for growth you know anywhere in nature you know actually to grow you have to have pain sadly i wish it wasn't that way <laughs> but you know hayden somehow woke me up out of that i think it was extraordinary he saved my life i think he saved our marriage you know karen and i were married but was it really deep and super strong and you know was it growing or was it flat you know i think our marriage has become so much richer so much stronger through this suffering that we went through i think hayden saved our marriage you know and i keep meeting people who say gosh you know hayden has inspired me to go and do this or go and do that and i think he has saved many lives actually you know but th he did it for me so when you say do i feel i radiate acceptance i think how could i not you know having seen a quality of acceptance that was i think remarkable especially for a 19 year old right yeah thank you thank you for saying that i i'm not sure i'm always accepting there are times when i i struggle i really struggle i wrote this book partially because i needed to process what i was going through you know maybe it sounds now that i'm in a position of strength and acceptance maybe some wisdom that i learned from it but I was thrown against the rocks. We all were, every one of our family. Um, maybe I was somehow tenderized by that process. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this time last year I was with my brother. I was visiting him in Canada and it was cold and I didn't have a jacket. And Simon said to me, oh, you can borrow a jacket. You know, do you want to borrow one? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. We we're going to go out for a walk. And he reached into the coat closet and he said, is Hayden's jacket okay? Because Hayden had borrowed Simon's jacket when we were living in Toronto, going to all those treatments. And my brother had this wonderful winter jacket, warm jacket. And so I took this jacket and I was holding, Simon handed me this jacket that I had seen Hayden wear every day in Toronto, going in and out of those hospitals. And I reached into the pocket and the Purell hand sanitizer that Hayden had was still in the jacket and it's just like I just collapsed I melted I started weeping like a baby you know it was too much for me to bear so sometimes those moments do come back you know and it becomes overwhelming and I realize I will never hug him again you know and I can't sit with him and talk about architecture and things that we would have talked about and enjoyed together we won't ever have a family holiday together again 
not in the physical, material sense. So I live with the spiritual reality, which is, of course, the most important, but it's not as tangible. You can't smell it and hold it and hug it, you know. That's my lot, and I accept it. How do you understand grief? (sighs) Well, the best... The insight to grief that has helped me most is that grief is love with nowhere to go. You know, when you love somebody, you can hug them and you can go for a walk with them and be with them, right? But when that person is not there, you know, there's just, it just, where does that go? You can't express it. So it emerges as tears in your eyes or as a lump in your throat or as a constriction of your chest, you know, and those feelings of pain and grief but it's really love if you don't love somebody you can't grieve them (laughs) right so actually it's not bad but if grief becomes crippling that you can't actually function as a human being and it does for some people especially for parents and siblings closest um it's not healthy so i think one therapist shared with me Grief is unhealthy. Mourning is healthy. So then we go into a whole discussion. What's the difference between grieving and mourning? You know, I think grieving is quite negative. You know, it's just tasting and retasting the bitterness. Whereas mourning is is a sort of processing of loss. And I think we have to get better at mourning our loved ones and somehow let go of grieving because it doesn't help us you know that's a transition that maybe some therapists could help us with (laughs) what is it but love persevering Mm. i think that's exactly what it is it's love persevering you know and you know the great thing about the great thing about love is that it's spiritual right it's not a it may be expressed physically but it's a spiritual quality. It's a virtue. It's what my Christian friends call a fruit of the Spirit, right? In the Baha'i writings, you know, Baha'u'llah says it's the first principle, right, is love. So, you know, that means that if we form bonds of love in this world, those don't die when we die. They keep going. So my my personal understanding of the next world, which is very immature, I don't really understand the next world, but is that our associations are based on love, are based on these spiritual qualities. But love is the attractive force. So if we have relationships of love, those continue, and we will find that in the next world, we are closest to those with whom we have formed the closest bonds of love. And if there is no love, we don't have an association in the next world. It's not possible. There's nothing to associate us because that associative quality, that glue, is love. Yeah. So we have to persevere in our love. You know, even for those people who may seem unlovable, because if we can persevere and we can experience love and forge bonds of love, that is an extraordinary investment because it's eternal. I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, Bashir, thank you. Really nice to meet you and to have this interview. Yeah. Thank you.